We've got big news tonight in the case involving the death of 11-year-old Gannon Stout. This is a little boy who went missing out of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Eventually, his remains were found in Florida. His stepmother charged with his murder. But this case has kind of been just, um, nothing's been happening for months because of the mental condition of Letitia Stout, the stepmother. Well, all of that has now changed. Julie Grant has more for us. Letitia Stauk, the woman accused of murdering her 11-year-old stepson, has again been deemed competent to stand trial. Stauk's case was on pause, pending a review of her initial competency evaluation conducted by the state hospital last year. That evaluation found her competent, but the defense moved for an independent assessment with a doctor of their choosing. This week, the court deemed Stauk competent after the psychiatrist retained by the defense came to the same conclusion as the state's examiner. That means after more than six months of delay, Stauk's case is back on track. Letitia Stauk reported her stepson Gannon missing from his Colorado Springs home on January 27, 2020. Stauk told investigators that Gannon never returned home after playing with his friends. Police opened a missing person investigation while the community took action to try to bring Gannon home. Whatever we could do just to like show them that we're thinking of them and you know they're in our thoughts and prayers. Investigators examined countless phone, GPS and home security records and a surveillance video from a neighbor's home. Or so just didn't seem right where she was talking. Okay. If my child is missing, I'm gonna face the camera and talk to you. You know, that you see the pain in my face. Search warrants uncovered blood matching Gannon's DNA in his room and in the garage near Letitia's car. And the evidence was enough for an arrest. Two weeks later, Gannon's remains were found in Florida, about 15 miles north of Pensacola. Letitia Stauk is presumed innocent, and according to the arrest affidavit, she has a story. She told investigators Gannon was abducted by a Hispanic man named Eduardo, who took Gannon at gunpoint after sexually assaulting Letitia inside the family's home. That's a story investigators don't believe. Now that Letitia Stauk is competent to stand trial, she's scheduled for a two-day preliminary hearing on March 11th and 12th. All right, the prelim is coming up. She's now competent to stand trial, but... You know, this is one of those things, we've seen her in court a few times, but we really haven't heard much from her. But Letitia Stout gave one interview to a local TV station in Colorado Springs, KKTV, on January 31st last year. Her stepson Gannon was still missing at the time. Now, in the interview, she has her back turned to the camera. Just her hair is showing as she's speaking with the KKTV reporter. She talks about various issues in the interview, but we've really zeroed in on the, the portion that speaks to the issues that fall under the umbrella of competency, understanding the nature of the proceedings and being able to assist in one's own defense. Here, she claims her constitutional rights were violated when she answered questions from detectives. I asked for an attorney during the interview, uh, and I was denied that by them. I was held because they were blocking the door and I was told I couldn't leave and that if I would have touched them, they would have probably, you know, said I still wasn't complying or said I was, you know, trying to run away or something. But during the interview, I asked several times, could I stop the interview? Could I get an attorney? Could I stop the interview? Could I get an attorney? I was denied. I was told I couldn't get nothing to drink. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I mean, it was continuously that my constitutional rights were violated. So there she clearly seems like she knows what's going on, right? Uh, but that is not relevant because competency is about what she's like now. And they have now found that she is competent. So this prelim will go forward. Let's bring back in our think tank and begin, of course, in Colorado with Jeffrey Wolf. Um, so here's the question. We've got the, the preliminary hearing, hearing, hearing coming up. She's now competent. When you have a client like that who's in and out of competency, um, I guess it's always an issue, always will be, but how difficult is it to represent someone like that? I mean, she's already told a couple different stories. Um, how do you handle all that? 
Well, it's going to be incredibly difficult. We have a really good public defender's office here, and she's represented very well by her attorneys down there. I happen to know one of them, and she's a very passionate attorney, and I guarantee they didn't take the issue of competency lightly, especially with the charges she's facing. She could sit in a mental health facility for the rest of her life if found incompetent on charges like this. And so for them, it's going to be incredibly difficult to deal with a client who has a transient mental health issue that comes and goes, which could be exactly what's going on here and could be the reason that they're having so much difficulty. Throw COVID into that, where the Colorado Springs jail was just sued to high heaven for not giving masks to the inmates and having one of the largest COVID outbreaks in our state. And it's hard to even get in there and have a face-to-face conversation with her. So they're on video chats and things along those lines. It is going to be a really tough hill to climb for some really good lawyers out here. Yeah, uh, Neem, I think the biggest hill to climb is gonna be getting around the different stories. So uh, as a prosecutor, do you prepare for the, um, I think his name is Edgardo, the rapist story, or do you prepare for, he went over to a friend's house. As a prosecutor, you love those inconsistent stories, right? I mean, the Hispanic rapist is just absurd and offensive. But even, you know, going to your friend's house, you know, from just listening to the prosecutors in this case, and Colorado, I mean, it's not a death penalty state, you know, so that's not an option. But they are very confident that they're going to try this case. They're going to ask for life. They're not going to give any discounts because they have all the evidence that they need. They have the DNA. They have the blood. They know how this poor 11-year-old was killed. So I expect and they expect that this case is going to move forward. And those inconsistent statements are going to be the nail in our coffin. Bernardo, this is a complicated case for a prosecutor, though, uh, because of there's, there's, there's many different scenes. There's the house. Then there's where Gannon's body was originally supposed to be disposed of in Colorado. Then we know it was recovered down in Pace, Florida, and she was arrested in South Carolina. So there's a lot of, a lot of evidence, a lot of things you've got to organize well in this case, and, and it's got to all make sense to the jury. So, Vinny, a case like this, you have a lot of moving pieces. So you're going to deal with a lot of witnesses because, obviously, you're going to have to deal with law enforcement in Florida, law enforcement in, in South Carolina, also law enforcement in Colorado. And what this also tells me that you're also going to be dealing with a lot of cell site and cell phone data that has to be presented to the jury because there has to have been some link to be able to trace that the body is in Florida. So what you'll need in this case is a prosecutor who is very organized to keep everything in order, but also be able to explain it and deliver it to a jury so the jury can understand in layman terms what actually happened in this case and why this woman is guilty of stabbing and killing an 11-year-old child. Jeffrey Wolf, let me ask you something. Take us behind the curtain for a second here. Um, she has told a couple different stories, allegedly, right? Let's say you, as the defense attorney, you have your conference with her, and she tells you a third story. Um, how, how does that analysis go in terms of what the arguments are that you make or what evidence you pursue um, and, 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 you know, what your whole what you're going to tell this jury ultimately when if, if you're getting all these conflicting versions of, of what took place. Right. Well, the old adage is you can't ride two horses, right? So what you need to do is you need to evaluate, you need to track down the different stories that you're being told. If there are different stories they're being told at this point or whether she's settled on one version of events that is her truth that she's living in. And you got to ride that horse. You got to ride that horse hard. You can't throw a bunch of different things at a jury. The DA's office is obviously going to play up the inconsistent statements. But at some point when you get in there, you got to have a theme of your case. You got to have a story that you're looking to tell and you have to stick with that one story and move forward.